Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Delacluse. I'm the general manager of Rake Rents. I'd like to thank all of you to, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for our webinar on personal silica exposure monitoring. Our presenter today is Aaron Apostolico of Sensonine. In this 45-minute free webinar, he will cover the following. Why silica is a problem, OSHA's crystalline silica exposure rule, sampling strategies, pumps, media, and accessories required to address common problems and concerns, and then ask the expert your questions answered. Aaron currently serves as product line manager for health and safety instruments at Sensodyne LP. He has proven experience in evaluating safety hazards, risk analysis, safety program audits, compliance review, and development and implementation of safety programs. He holds the Bachelor's of Science degree in Environmental Science from Rutgers University and holds professional designations as Certified Industrial Hygienist, Certified Safety Professional, and, and as a Certified Indoor Environmental Consultant. Because of the large number of attendees, we'll be muting the phone lines. If you have any questions, there's a chat tool built into GoToWebinar. Please enter your questions and we'll make sure it gets answered. Now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Aaron. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know this is a hot topic as the rule just went into effect on September 23rd. Let me make sure. <clears throat> All right. Um, as we get started, and as um, Matt alluded to, uh, this is a little bit of an outline for today's conversation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about silica, some background, some history on it. We'll talk a little bit about the silica rule, um, what's really changed and, and how it impacts us. Uh, we'll talk about really what industries are impacted by it. And then we're going to get into what I think is really the fun part, uh, the different sampling strategies that we can use to be in compliance with the rule. We'll talk about some common issues that customers experience. Um, I can tell you that, you know, as a CIH, I've been in the field over 17 years. Um, I've done quite a bit of uh, silica sampling over the, the last uh, couple decades, and I have some interesting experiences that I think, um, you know, you guys can find valuable and, and find some real takeaways from. And then we'll talk about uh, different equipment, accessories, and um, we'll end with some uh, some questions and answers uh, if we can get to them. <clears throat> so why is silica a problem? Uh, first, we have to understand really what is silica. Um, you know, silica is present in many materials. It's a natural mineral, um, silicon dioxide. 15% of the Earth's crust is made up of silica. Uh, you'll find it in sand, granite, other types of rocks. Um, <clears throat> in OSHA's terms, they regulate three different types of silica. Uh, you'll see it mostly as quartz. That's the most common. We find that in concrete. Um, and then the other two different types that you'll uh, see noted in OSHA is cristabolite and tritomite. These are less common, but, you know, we still see them in quite a bit of uh, minerals, that are out there in the market. Uh, generally, these evolve from volcanic rock activities. Um, all forms of silica have different um, analysis diffraction patterns through X-ray diffraction. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the analytical methods uh, in some later slides. But I did want to talk about different sources. Um, silica, you know, as you find it in like beach sand, is fairly large. Respirable silica is really created through an activity. And <clears throat> on this side, I bolted, you know, some of those activities that can actually aerosolize and really cause the respirable silica to become harmful. Those activities include operations such as abrasive blasting, uh, drilling of concrete, masonry concrete work, mining, cement and asphalt manufacturing operations, jackhammering, uh, specifically on concrete, but other types of brick, um, any type of brick and concrete block cutting, uh, as you see in the, in the photograph pictured here, uh, fiber cement siding work, as well as different fracking operations. 
So why is silica such a problem and what has really triggered this rule? Well, exposure to respirable silica has been linked to such health hazards as silicosis, lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD, as well as kidney failure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it should be noted that silicosis is often a fatal lung disease. Um, it's when you get those silicate uh, particles really down into your uh, lower respiratory system that it can really become harmful and cause the uh, occupational lung disease known as silicosis. For those that are not as biologically inclined, this diagram is really in here to show different dust fractions. Um, we talk about different dust sizes when we uh, refer to inhalable dust. This is any dust particle um, that is less than 100 microns in size. When we talk about the thoracic dust fraction, this is that 10 micron and smaller particle diameter. These particles can get into that upper respiratory tract, so your lower trachea and your upper lungs, and into your bronchi. But when we get to the respirable fraction, those dust particles that are less than four microns in size, that can really make it into the um, uh, lower bronchial areas um, and the alveolar sacs. You know, this is really where the oxygen transport in your lungs comes from. And this is why when you block that oxygen transport, you have difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, you can turn blue from lack of oxygen, and virtually you're almost suffocating. So some of the reasons behind the new rule. Um, you know, the community and the industry has known for many years that the permissible exposure limits uh, might not have been protective of human health where they should have been. Uh, the previous PELS um, for OSHA, as well as MSHA, and the uh, ACGIH originally were based off of some complicated formulas and you had to do some calculations based on the percent silica from the overall dust concentrations that were analyzed through gravimetric analysis. So they really wanted to, to simplify this process and come out with a set concentration that can be relied on. <clears throat> Other methods for um, counting particles you know, we're also very complex and very outdated. Um, <clears throat> in general, or in the general industry, uh, the formula for the permissible exposure limit was equal or worked out to be around 100 micrograms per cubic meter. In the construction industry and the maritime industry, uh, it was a little over two and a half times that, around 250 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, many testing and epidemiological showed that the uh, previous permissible exposure limits really didn't adequately protect workers' health, and this was evident by um, multiple health complications and issues that resulted in lung cancer and silicosis from exposures less than the 100 micrograms per cubic meter. The new rule is really two different standards. There was one standard that was written uh, for the general industry and maritime industry, and then the second rule was really written for the construction industry, noting that the vast majority of jobs and industry impacts were to the construction industry. They made it a little bit more stringent with some specific call-outs in the construction industry. However, for the most part, the general maritime industry and the construction industry standards were very close to one another. For today's purposes, we'll focus on the construction standard, as really that is the most prevalent. And if you're in compliance with the construction standard, you would be in compliance with most general industry and maritime standards as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you can see highlighted in uh, red here on the right, um, we're going to really focus on some of the specified exposure control methods as well as the alternative exposure control methods. We'll talk about that a little bit more and how the use of various equipment and sampling techniques can aid in compliance with the construction standard for silica. So what's within the scope? 
All occupational exposures to respirable silica are covered unless the employee exposure will remain below 25 micrograms per cubic meter as an eight-hour TWA under any foreseeable conditions. I wanted to read that out particularly to note a couple of things. One, the permissible exposure limit is 50, but the action limit is going to be 25 micrograms per cubic meter, which is half the permissible exposure limit. The last uh, section of that where we talk about under any foreseeable conditions. I really wanted to um, extract on that, uh, that concept. And this is uh, that under OSHA's definition, employers must have objective data demonstrating employee exposure to respirable crystalline silica associated with a particular product, material, or a specific process, task, or activity will remain below this action level. I can tell you from personal experience that this is a very high criteria to meet, that you have this objective data that you can use for any foreseeable condition. You really need a lot of data points with a lot of good detail in order to meet this requirement to get out of um, requirements under this particular standard. Um, the specified exposure control methods. So this is something that's new, where they took good practices within industry, known objective data in industry, and came out with some fixed engineering control work practice methods that could be applied for use with a total of 18 different, um, I would say, equipment slash task activities where silica dust is produced. This table is in the rule. Um, like I said, there's 18 different sections. I'll show you another example of it here momentar momentarily. But employers that fully and properly implement these rules within table one do not have to comply with the PEL, and they do not have to conduct additional exposure assessments for employees engaged in those tasks. I'm gonna put a caveat on that, that these tasks are somewhat specific in nature, and that deviation away from these tasks would no longer fall within the scope of this particular control method and would require um, sampling. So a couple things about this uh, table one that I'm gonna go over. So in the far left column, you'll see that they'll talk about a specific tool or activity. The setter uh, talks about the engineering or work practice control methods. And then the columns on the right will talk about respiratory protection. I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but for those who are not as familiar with respiratory protection, um, APF is the assigned protection factor. Um, OSHA dictates different assigned protection factors for different types of respirators. Um, in this particular case, uh, they mainly use an APF of 10, which is uh, this device generally will protect uh, the wearer up to 10 times the permissible exposure limit. So if we're talking a permissible exposure limit of 50 micrograms per cubic meter and you're wearing a respirator uh, with an APF of 10, you could really be in an environment up to 500 micrograms per cubic meter. Now I can tell you from personal experience, if you're in 500 micrograms per cubic meter, you're in a pretty dusty environment. You, I mean, you're visibly gonna see this dust in front of your face. Um, that being said, I have personal experience in, um, you know, several, uh, or with several clients where I've been in levels that have far exceeded that. Um, and really depending on the environmental conditions going on with a specific activity, you can easily exceed 500 micrograms per cubic meter. As I mentioned, there's a total of 18 different uh, entries in the table. Uh, here's a list of those. Um, they include things like stationary masonry saws, the handheld power saws, uh, power saws for fiber cement board. On with the activity and the environmental conditions as well as what's being cut. But drivable saws, rig-mounted core saws or drills, 
handheld and stand mounted drills, dowel drilling rigs for concrete, any type of vehicle mounted drilling rigs, jackhammers and handheld chipping tools, handheld grinders, uh, specifically for mortar removal. And then there's handheld grinders for other than mortar removal, walking behind milling machines and floor grinders, small drivable milling machines, large drivable milling machines, uh, crushing machines, heavy equipment and utility vehicles to abrade or fracture silicon materials, uh, a lot of times used in the mining industries, uh, and then heavy equipment and utility vehicles for grading and excavating. You can see that this is a pretty uh, encompassing list but understand that um, a lot of these applications not only apply to the person operating the piece of equipment, but these could be secondary personnel that are in the area who might be supporting that operation. For example, you know, you're breaking up concrete, you have a second guy, uh, or you have one guy on a jackhammer, he would be covered, but also the guy who's coming in with the wheelbarrow um, and hauling out the broken up concrete, he has to also be equally protected under this um, uh, engineering work practice control method. Some alternative exposure control methods. Um, this really goes to talk about what the permissible exposure limit is. As I mentioned, it's 50 micrograms uh, per meter as an eight hour TWA. When we say eight hour TWA under most OSHA PELs, um, this is the eight hour time weighted average. And the action limit again is half the PEL also has an eight hour time weighted average. Alternative exposure control methods can include an exposure assessment. And this is where required and if determined by a competent person, um, exposures that may be above the action level of 25 micrograms per cubic meter, all right, or exposures can be done through the following. You have a performance option or scheduled monitoring option uh, program. The performance option discusses exposures assessed using a combination of air monitoring data or objective data sufficient to accurately characterize the employee exposures to respirable uh, silica. This is going to be your typical types of air monitoring using pumps and cyclones and impactors. Um, you can also rely on objective data, although it's very important that when using objective data, you're relating apples to apples. Now, objective data can include air monitoring data from industry-wide surveys, calculations based on the uh, composition of a substrate. If you know, for example, that a certain type of brick contains, you know, 25% quartz, then you can make a calculation based on uh, some general dust levels of maybe through direct uh, read instrumentation of how much exposure would be present or how much silica exposure would be present based on the actual uh, composition of that particular material being cut. Um, Objective data also demonstrates employees' exposure associated with a particular product, material, specific process, task, or activity. What this really means or refers to is that for each type of activity or environmental condition or process, you need to have some sort of data to really compare apples to apples with your operation in order to use that data to say that I'm below a certain standard or to say that, yes, we're complying with um, the more stringent standard based on this objective data. Uh, objective data also must reflect workplace conditions closely resembling or with higher exposure potential than the process, types of material, control methods, work practices, and environmental conditions in the employer's current operations. Again, this is where we have to look at uh, certain environmental factors, such as, are you working indoors? Is it a confined space? What kind of air movement is in the area? What type of material is being cut or disturbed or generating the um, aerosolized respirable silica? Um, 
what type of equipment is actually generating it, such as you know a certain type of cutting saw at a certain type of RPM may produce a different um, exposure than a different saw at a lower RPM. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, if you find that you are above the 25 micrograms per cubic meter for the eight hour TWA, you can go with the scheduled monitoring option. All right, this is a specific schedule that says you'll perform an initial assessment. If your initial assessment is below the action limit of 25, no additional monitoring needs to be done unless circumstances change. If you are going with that option, you really need to make sure that you document very specifically what was sampled and what are you claiming um, was the objective data that was gathered through that initial monitoring. Um, if you are above the action limit, you are required to repeat the sampling event within six months. If you are above the permissible exposure limit, you're gonna be required to repeat uh, sampling within three months. You'll continue to um, perform the scheduled monitoring option until you have two consecutive results that are taken at more than seven days apart that are below the action limit of 25. At that point, monitoring can be discontinued. However, um, as conditions change, as materials change, as equipment change, you must reassess your operations to make sure that the change in those circumstances has not affected the exposure limits. Now, Appendix A of the crystalline silica rule um, talks about different methods of sample analysis. Uh, employers must ensure that the samples are analyzed by a laboratory uh, that follows the procedures in Appendix A. Now, Appendix A calls out really, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's six particular sample methods. This is gonna be your OSHA methods, your NIOSH methods, and your MSHA methods. Uh, in general, the methods contain uh, gravimetric analysis with a combination of either X-ray diffraction or infrared uh, spectrometry. Uh, and there's a couple different types of infrared spectrometry, but in general, uh, the most popular methods are the NIOSH 7500 method and the NIOSH 7602 method. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in order to comply, with the uh, new standard, a OSHA requires that a competent person write an exposure control plan. Now, this plan must describe tasks that involve exposures to respirable silica. It must describe the engineering controls and work practices used to protect the employees against overexposure, housekeeping measures to limit exposure, and then procedures used to restrict access when necessary to limit exposures. This goes back to when I was uh, discussing making sure that you control that hazardous area, limiting who can go in that area, and then making sure that those people, not just the person who might be creating it uh, from the source, but any secondary personnel are wearing equal protection to that person who's generating um, the source exposures. Now, what is required by a competent person? OSHA defines a competent person uh, in the construction industry uh, as someone who must designate um, or must be designated by the construction employer to implement the written exposure control plan. This is an individual capable of identifying existing and foreseeable respirable uh, silica hazards who has authorization to take prompt corrective measures and who can make frequent and regular inspections of job sites, materials, and equipment. I highly recommend that this is a person that either oversees the sampling, performs the sampling, or contracts the consultant uh, to perform the sampling, but really understands where the consultant needs to sample, what needs to be sampled, what methods should be followed, and really what is the best equipment used to get the information needed in order to make sure you're compliant with the standard. Um, one of the other uh, requirements 
And uh, this is a requirement of several standards that have been out there. But if you are required to wear a respirator, you must be part of a, respir a respirator protection program. That in itself requires medical surveillance. But in addition to that, the new rule says the employers must offer <clears throat> medical examination to workers who will be required to wear a respirator under the standard for more than 30 or more days a year. Employers must offer examinations every three years to workers who continue to be exposed above the trigger. I'll put another note on that, that, that if determined by the um, healthcare provider who performs the examination, sometimes uh, additional uh, or more frequent examinations may be um, recommended by the physician. Now, these medical uh, surveillance exams do include physicals, chest x-rays, and pulmonary function tests. I'll put a note or asterisk around that as I know and have worked with quite a few people in the construction industry um, who would have trouble passing some of these tests. Um, it should be noted that if you cannot pass a pulmonary function test, you can't wear a respirator, and that if an employer puts you in a respirator, not having passed this test that really falls <clears throat> under high liability for that employer, not to mention that it could actually increase uh, pulmonary stress or breathing stress, which could lead to some other complications. Um, and again, that could fall on some high liability for the employer if they were to do so uh, with an employee who did not pass their medical surveillance exam. So talking about the industries and operations with the highest exposures that we really feel are going to be the most impacted, as I mentioned before, the construction industry, glass manufacturing, uh, pottery products, structural clay products, concrete products, obviously some foundry operations, uh, maybe surprisingly dental laboratories, uh, <clears throat> paintings and coatings operations, jewelry production, refractory products, different asphalt products, landscaping that uses different sands and silicas in their uh, uh, field work, ready mix concrete, um, stone and um, cutting stone operations, any type of abrasive blasting that uses any type of silica media. Um, this uh, can be broken into some specific standards, but maritime work, construction work, and general industry work. You have your refractory furnace installation and repair. You have your railroad service work, and then the hydraulic fracturing uh, for gas and oil. <clears throat> that is not an all-inclusive list, but that encompasses probably most of what will be impacted by this new rule. Um, talking about some sampling strategies, now we're going to get into some of the more of the uh, uh, interesting part of the uh, presentation. This is where we can use different methods um, for sampling to achieve compliance and to really get to our um, our prognosis for, for what engineering controls can be utilized or if we can um, become, um, excuse me, uh, outside the scope of the standard being below 25% or being below 25 micrograms uh, per cubic meter. So here what we have are six existing sample methods. Uh, we have the OSHA ID 142, we have the NIOSH 7500, the NIOSH 7602, NIOSH 7603, and then the MSHA P2 and MSHA P7 uh, methods. What's different about um, this new limit is that they have uh, recommended that we obtain a quantitative limit of detection no higher than 25% of the permissible exposure limit based on air volume. All right, what this means is you need a large enough sample required to reach the detection limit at the laboratory down to 12.5 micrograms per cubic meter. With our previous sampling methodologies, using a traditional 10 millimeter door oliver cyclone at 1.7 liters per minute, we often would not get 
enough volume coming across our sample media in order to be within the laboratory's detection limit. So what does this mean? It means we either have to find a different means of sampling, uh, and especially sampling for lower duration tasks or short periods of time. So several uh, new pieces of equipment or newer pieces of equipment have come out in industry. Uh, this includes uh, cyclones as well as impactors that have higher flow rates. Um, so applying the formula of 1.7 liters per minute for 60 minutes times eight hours gives you a total volume of 813 liters, which is 0.813 uh, cubic meters. And that's really about what you need to reach the lower detection limit for some of these methods. However, if you have a four hour task that you want to sample, you really need to be at a, a flow rate that's at least twice what, uh, what you are with the Dora Oliver. So for that, there are some medium flow rate cyclones. The GK 2.69 uh, is one of those. It samples at uh, 4.2 liters per minute. Um, another cyclone that's out there is called the Rascal. Um, it samples at 8.5 to 9.5 liters per minute, usually right around nine liters per minute, right around the sweet spot. Uh, as you move up to the higher um, flow rates, you have a little bit more leniency uh, with the flow rates. But when you're at those medium and low flow rates, you really need to be right on point, really plus or minus 5% of that flow rate to be at that four micron cut point or 50%. Um, and that's really how they calibrate um, the aerodynamics of the cyclone particulates to really get the four micron size. Too much or too little, you'll actually misrepresent your concentration. So some silica sampling best practices. As I mentioned, it's important that you draw enough uh, airflow in your sample to obtain the maximum limit of detection. Generally, we shoot for around 12.5 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, you'll use the analysis either by your X-ray diffraction or your infrared uh, as described in the six methods. Um, you'll observe the cyclone flow rate specifications for meeting the ACGIH size selection curve, and that's 50% at four microns, which is what we use here in the United States. Uh, over in Europe, they use a 50% at five micron cut rate. Um, I think we're a little bit more conservative at the four microns, showing that we've actually had epidemiological studies um, that show the smaller microns actually have an increased health impact. Um, it's important that you use a constant flow, as I mentioned before, uh, um, having a constant flow control pump that will keep the flow rates at plus or minus 5% of the set flow. A medium uh, flow cyclone can meet the detecting limit in an eight hour sample and still be comfortable to wear. I add that in there as you move up to the larger size cyclones, uh, an example would be this one in this lower right hand cor corner. Um, this cyclone is a little bit larger, uh, has a little bit more weight to it, probably not as comfortable to wear, but may be appropriate if you need to collect a sample for a task that's maybe 30 minutes in length uh, to an hour in length. So how do you choose the right cyclone? Um, not only how do you choose the right cyclone, how do you choose the right pump to go with the right cyclone? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few different cyclones. Um, that are available on the market and really what are the best pumps to go with it. As I mentioned, it's important that not only you can maintain the constant flow at the desired um, flow rate for that specific type of cyclone, that it stays constant and that it can also meet the back pressure needs for that particular device or activity. So pictured here is the 10 millimeter nylon cyclone. This is the common Dora Oliver cyclone that's out there. Um, it's been used since the early 1960s. It continues to be one of the most common models used in the United States. Um, again, it's great if you're sampling in a, I would say, medium uh, to high dusty environment and you can sample for an eight hour time period. 
Um, this cyclone is really specified in numerous NIOSH and OSHA test, test methods because it's been around for so long, it's so uh, well studied. Um, you can use various uh, pumps. Uh, of course, I'm a little biased uh, working for uh, Sensenine, but here are four different pumps that are on the, uh, available to use with the Door Oliver. You have your Gil Air 3, you have your Gil Air 5 pump, you have your Gillian 5000 pump and the Gill Air Plus pump. Um, each one of these pumps actually has different unique features that you might want to consider. But one of the key factors to consider not only is, is the uh, pump's maximum flow rate, but also what the maximum back pressure is. If you're in a more dusty environment, as you increase the loading on your cassette, you'll increase the back pressure and you don't want to trip out. Uh, the pump that's being used and, and negate your sampling event. For example, if you're in a really dusty environment, even with a Door Oliver, I probably wouldn't recommend using the Gil Air 3. I would use a minimum of the Gil Air 5, the Gillian 5000, which probably has the highest back pressure, or our Gil Air Plus models. Um, again, one of the benefits with the Gil Air Plus model is it has um, a Bluetooth connectivity that you can actually monitor what your back pressure is in real time. And if you are getting overclouding on the cassette, you can actually make adjustments or change out your media to continue your sampling event without um, overloading a cassette or tripping out your pump. So that is one advantage with the, the Gillian uh, Gil Air Plus models. But generally, all four of these could work with the 1.7 liter per minute flow rates for the Door Oliver. Um, this particular um, BGI 4L, uh, this is a Higgins dual model. Um, it flows at 2.2 liters per minute uh, for the 50% cut point. Again, you know, consider the, uh, the back pressure capabilities. Um, this is, uh, takes a three-piece style cassette. And again, I'd recommend the Gil Air Plus or Gillian 5000 um, for this method. Um, the Gill Air 5 will work, but it does not hold as high of a back pressure as the Gillian 5000 or the uh, Gill Air Plus models. Um, this is the medium flow rate GK 2.69. Again, if you're having to sample for a shorter period of time, I would go away from the low flow rates and jump up to the medium flow rates or high flow rate uh, cyclone samplers. Um, this flows at 4.2 liters per minute. You'd be real close with the Gilly Air uh, Plus model and the Gillian 5000 model, depending on if you're in a really high uh, silica exposure environment, you may wanna go up to the Gillian 10i, which again can um, handle a little bit more power and a little bit more uh, back pressure for that sampling event. Uh, Again, and this, this particular unit um, is one of uh, several cyclones that really can meet the need for a shorter duration um, sampling event. This is the uh, High Flow Rascal Cyclone, the GK 4.162. Um, as I mentioned before, this has a flow rate between 8.5 and 9.5 liters per minute. Um, it comes in two different models. One has the aluminum filter holder. The other one has a plastic filter holder. Um, either one of them, uh, you know, will meet your needs. Note that this comes with a little bit larger filter as well. Um, the other ones generally come with a standard th a 37 millimeter filter. This comes with a 47 or is made for a 47 millimeter filter um, membrane. And because of the high uh, flow rates for this, we recommend using the Gillian 12 uh, because of its high flow rate and high back pressure capabilities. Uh, this is another model. This is the FSP-10. Uh, this is a European style cyclone that we offer. It's very common um, over the pond. Uh, this does take a 37 millimeter uh, five micron PVC um, filter membrane. Um, it was developed um, in Germany and it runs at 11.2 liters per minute. And again, for this one, the only pump that's really available, um, 
that can hold the constant flow is the Gillian 12 for use with this particular type of um, cyclone. This cyclone and the rascal would both be appropriate if you're taking those really short duration tasks, um, like I said, less than an hour, and you really want to make sure that you have enough air volume uh, in order to achieve the uh, laboratory's limit of detection. Some alternative sampling devices that are out there. Um, within the new silica rule, OSHA adopted the ISO 7708 uh, method. This is performance criteria for respirable samples, uh, samplers. Um, this rule has opened the door for a variety of alternative devices, such as impactors. Uh, this impactor right here is, is one of several on the market. This is a, an HPEM. Uh, this was actually part of a Harvard study, um, and, and there's several literature available um, out there. What's nice about the uh, impactors is generally they're a little bit smaller, a little bit lightweight, and again, with this impactor, it can be uh, sampling at that 50% uh, cut rate for uh, four micron respirable silica at nine liters per minute using the Gillian 10i pump. One of the other alternative sampling devices that are um, that is relatively new to the market is uh, the Respricon. Now this is a system that uses a combined uh, filter sampler with a real-time uh, particle detection unit. Uh, this unit uh, really combines the best of both worlds in a single instrument. The aerodynamic separation and collection of inhalable thoracic and respirable dust does not uh, only allow a direct gravimetric analysis, but you can do subsequent silica analysis. Uh, additionally, the scattered light um, photometers in every collection stage allow real-time recording of the dust concentrations. I'll go into this device a little bit more, um, but I, I put it in this section because it does fall under um, the ISO uh, requirements for sampling for silica on, uh, on media. It's a three-stage um, dust impactor that will actually separate out um, 10 micron, sorry, total dust, uh, generally under 100 micron, the 10 micron dust, and the 4 micron dust. Some alternative sampling devices. Um, this includes uh, dust monitors from the Respicon. Um, we have inhalable dust, uh, thoracic dust, and respirable dust particle size, as I mentioned before. Uh, there's two different models. One it runs at 3.11 liters per minute. Uh, the other one runs at 6.22 liters per minute. Uh, sampling strategies, um, again, using the direct read equipment, you can see that this is a three-stage impactor, and um, each stage, again, has a different uh, particle size that can not only be read through the optical sensor on the um, direct read instrument, but you can also then analyze each one of the filter beds for silica. The Respricon TM, again, some of the features about it, uh, you have one inlet that um, can be used to then uh, size select down to those three different sizes. It's generally simple to use. You don't have to change out the inlet head. It's easy to calibrate, uh, and you can get the real-time measurements. I bring this up because this is a great way to supplement your objective data. Not only can you get information about what the exposure is over the course of an eight hour period, you can actually collect real time data to see how much or what concentrations are coming in during a specific task or specific event. So this is one direct read equipment that will allow you to accomplish that. Um, as I mentioned before, there's two different instruments. There's the Respicon um, TM and the Respicon 2 TM. The Respicon TM utilizes a Gillian 5000 pump, and that runs at 3.11 liters per minute. And the Respicon 2 TM utilizes the Gillian 10i pump at 6.22 liters per minute. Some advantages are, you know, high accuracy. Uh, you have the photometric cells, which are fast direct readings. Uh, you have your gravimetric analysis. 
Uh, some disadvantages uh, with gravimetric is that, again, you have to send it off to a lab to have it analyzed. Um, with the photometric, again, dif difficulty calibration for a lot of photometric uh, devices, and the results depend on specific algorithms. Uh, but with this device, uh, it has fairly easy uh, calibration tools and um, can really meet both needs for uh, silica analysis as well as for direct read instrumentation. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time. I want to be conscious of everyone's time today. I'll talk a little bit about the nephilometer. Um, this is another direct reading instrument. Um, sensitized nephilometer is a handheld analytical instrument used to measure airborne dust levels. Uh, nephilometer, while it is a crazy sounding name, comes from uh, the Greek uh, term uh, cloud. Nep nephilometer meaning cloud, meter. Um, it should be noted that direct equipment, both the Respircon uh, by itself with the direct read instrument as well as the nephilometer, does not distinguish silica from other particulates. However, it's a good instrument for determining uh, engineering control effectiveness and especially objective data if you know the percent silica of the um, source that's being disturbed or generating the, the respirable dust. Generally, the nephilometer has advantages because it's portable, it's affordable, handheld, lightweight, long life batteries, it's got an internal uh, pump system, uh, it's really geared for construction type industries, it's very durable, and in general, it's a lower cost than other direct read equipment that's on the market. Uh, it comes with several different um, size selective heads. Uh, generally, their standard model has the total suspended particulate head. The deluxe model has three different heads available. You have the total suspended particulate. You have a PM10, sorry, four heads available. Total suspended particulate, PM10, PM2.5, and the newly released uh, PM4. Uh, four micron selectable head, which would be used in our um, respirable silicate um, direct read monitoring. Uh, as I mentioned, the deluxe model comes with the different impactors. You get a zero cap. It's really easy to use. It comes with some built-in um, uh, conversion factors, what we call K-factors. Um, so you can use it for different uh, sampling heads, and that would be programmed within the units. It has a USB charging port, or a USB uh, communication port, and a charging jack. Uh, the communication port does interface with software that does come with the unit. Uh, representative sampling. Workers often perform different tasks for different lengths of time. Um, these are some common issues that, that I found might be helpful. Um, the permissible exposure limit of 50 as an eight-hour time-weighted average. However, a task duration sample may be used as objective data to illustrate exposures during specific tasks and conditions. It may also be used for the purpose of delineating restricted work areas. So sampling may be done using a cyclone with a higher flow rate. Um, as I mentioned before, the Rascal and the, uh, the FSP are two of the higher models, and then there's a few of the medium flow rates um, that are available as well. You want to check and really see how much, you know, if you have visible clouds and you know you're in some very high uh, dusty areas, um, you may want to go with one of the mid, um, mid range cyclones. If you know you're in a not so dusty area and you really want to get a valid sample and make sure that you get the minimum uh, concentration needed for the laboratory detection limit, I would go with the higher flow rate cyclone. Uh, again, it's important to know that the objective data includes air monitoring data from industry-wide sources. Uh, you can demonstrate employee exposures associated with a particular product or material, and it must reflect workplace conditions uh, comparing apples to apples. Um, another common uh, experience that happens with, with cyclones um, and even with impactors is that a personal monitoring pump is working uh, to move air against the back pressure. As you start loading up the back pressure on your cassette or, or media, um, 
it can end up overloading the pump's capability. If it trips out the pump, then again, you lose your sample for the day. So you really wanna make sure that you're monitoring the back pressure um, and considering this when choosing the right pump for the job. Uh, pumps like the Gillian 5000 have a higher back pressure, the Gillian 10i even higher, and the Gillian 12 again has a little bit um, higher going up to around 40 inches of back pressure at those higher flow rates. Uh, this is a great diagram that just kind of illustrates for those of you who are not as familiar with, with the back pressure, um, this could be affected by both the size of the tubing, the length of the tubing, as well as um, how much load ends up on your media really makes the, uh, the pump, which would be the car in this example, have to work that much harder to achieve the same constant flow rate. And remember, constant flow rate is really critical with these impactors and cyclones as being, you know, more than plus or minus 5% off can really throw off what your um, particle size is and your, your overall concentration uh, for that particular um, sample event. Uh, flow rates and calibration. Um, as I just mentioned, setting the correct flow rates are crucial in performing size selective uh, particle sampling uh, for both cyclones and impactors. Um, you know, it's important that you use a reliable device with a reliable pump. Now, for many of the cyclones that are on the market, they do not have an inlet attachment on the cyclone. Um, you know, this is a common um, question that comes up is how do I calibrate with my cyclone. Uh, there are cyclone calibration jars on the market. Uh, we have one that is uh, uh, readily available. Again, this can be used in line. You put your cyclone inside. The cyclone, of course, is attached to your pump. Then there's a tubing that goes into the jar, which is tightly sealed, and then over to your, um, your calibration device. Um, again, this is re really recommended to get that accurate um, calibration for your cyclone. Uh, gravimetric versus silica concentrations. Uh, sample analysis may be a combination of both gravimetric analysis and si silica analysis. Uh, it should be noted that, you know, these are two different concentrations and that, you know, dust is made up of um, quite a few things. I mean, you can have organics, you can have things like pollen and mold spores, but really what we're referring to for silica concentration is a percentage of the dust that is quartz, cristabolite, or tridymite. Um, you know, this also holds true with direct reading equipment, that the concentrations measured with direct reading equipment measure overall dust um, of a certain particle size, but that equipment does not distinguish between silica and the other particle types, all right? If you are doing gravimetric analysis, um, note that you know there's a couple different types of media that's available out there. If you get pre-weighted media, you know understand the method that you're following and understand that you know if you're using a 0.8 micron uh, MCE, um, which is the cellulose ester media, that this is going to have a much higher back pressure than a five micron pore size. PVC cassette. So again, if you're using a 0.8 micron uh, set, make sure you choose the correct pump that will have the back pressure capable of uh, achieving your sampling event without tripping out. Um, if you have the 5 micron, which is a little bit larger pore size, you have a little bit more uh, capability with, with back pressure. But again, be conscious of that when you're performing your sampling event. Uh, for further detailed information on any of the Gillian products, please consult the product operation manuals. Um, manuals may be accessed through our website. Uh, and of course, if there's more information that you would like regarding the OSHA silica rule, uh, up here we have the uh, crystalline silica page um, web address from OSHA. Um, I know that Matt will have this uh, presentation posted and available. I've gone through a lot of material in the last 45, 50 minutes, and now I'm going to open it up for some questions.
All right, Aaron, I've got some questions that have come in online. Um, first one is, if exceeding the Pell, can the employer simply choose a mandatory respirator program and not, not perform follow-up sampling? So, yes, you don't. If you know that you're above the Pell, um, you can perform or you can choose the uh, engineering controls and methods that are in Table One. Just note that if you are audited. Um, they really want to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples and the application um, is, you know, uh, is protective enough. They may do some sampling if you are audited and if they find that you, you know, exceed the permissible exposure limit and you're not in adequate respiratory protection, you can be responsible or held responsible for putting uh, in the appropriate respiratory protection. That is to say that, let's just say you're in, you know, 1,000 micrograms per cubic meter and you're wearing a half mask respirator or a dusk mask style respirator, which is not adequate, you can still be held responsible for not being in the appropriate respirator. Okay, second question. If your results are at the Pell, how often should you repeat your sampling, if any? So if you're at the Pell, you're actually required to complete sampling every three months. Um, if you drop below the Pell, you will have to take a sample within six months. And then if you want to uh, close out and, and get to a point, and hopefully you can achieve um, through good engineering controls and work practices, consistent sampling below the action limit of 25. And if you can do that for two consecutive um, sampling events greater than seven days apart, then you can cease the uh, scheduled sampling option. Okay, question three. Are the new standards expressed as total crystalline silica or as the individual components of crystalline silica? In other words, is the AL25 microns per meter cubed for total silica or 25 micrograms per meter cubed for quartz? You know, I'm not 100% sure on that. So I, I would go back to the OSHA uh, website. It's my understanding that it would be um, total silica. So let's just say that you were, you know, 20 for quartz, but you were greater than five for cristabolite or tritomite, that you would be over the 25 micrograms, and that would put you into effect. Okay, next question. When you talk about short duration tasks and testing, if you have a task that only takes two hours in an eight hour shift, why would you want to sample only for the two hour exposure instead of sample for the full eight hour shift at a lower flow rate? Well, one of the reasons you might want to do that is that, you know, on Monday, the task is two hours. On Wednesday, the task is six hours. Um, so you're not always going to be able to sample in a worst case scenario. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, your total eight hour TWA is going to be representative. If you know what it is for a specific task, um, then you can extrapolate out what your um, TWA would be for that day. Also, you might have a combination of tasks. A lot of times you're not just doing that one task that one day. You might be doing several different tasks. So now when you're looking at objective data and maybe you're grinding for 30 minutes, you're jackhammering for two hours, and you are um, you know, performing some abrasive blasting, and it could be the same crew doing all three of those types of activities for different durations over the course of a day. So knowing what a specific task um, condition is would allow you to extrapolate whether or not you may be over the limit for a combination of tasks over that TWA. Okay. If you use direct reading instruments, how do you get the concentration of silica rather than just particles? So this is where if you have a known material, 
and you know the percent of silica in that material, then you could use that as objective data and say that, you know, my concentration of total dust was X, you know, therefore assuming, you know, 25% of that dust generated was silica, then, you know, my concentration could be 25, you know, times X. Okay. Are the aluminum cyclones by SKC able to be used for personal monitoring? That wasn't mentioned as a cyclone to be used. Well, we're a little partial to Sensodyne, uh, but yes, those can be used as well. Yes. Uh, how accurate are the impactors respricons? Oh, how so, accurate? Well, it's kind of two questions. How accurate are the impactors and then how accurate are the respricons? So uh, I talked about two different impactors. Um, I know SKC has some impactors that are disposable impactors. The HPEM is a little bit more hardy. Uh, it's actually, you know, part of a Harvard study. It, it, it's reliable. Uh, there's been several published papers. Um, I believe that as part of that Harvard study, they actually worked with uh, NIOSH as part of that as well. And um, it has proven technology, so it has been shown to be as accurate as as, um, as some of the cyclones. Uh, again, it's very crucial that you maintain the appropriate flow rates, uh, but the particle dynamics work um, you know, in a little bit different fashion with an impactor as opposed to a cyclone, but they can achieve ultimately, um, you know, very similar accuracies. Um, with the um, Respicon in particular, what's interesting and what's nice about that is, um, you know, it's an impactor as well, uh, but it uses the photometric cells to actually measure at each of the three stages what the concentration is in real time. Does the capture of particulate change with filter loading? Does the capture of filter particulate? Does the so, capture of particulate change with filter loading? So if you have a pump that is working in constant flow, and this is why it's so important that you choose the right pump, um, I won't knock competitor pumps, but um, when you have a constant flow pump, the pump will actually adjust with the filter loading. So if you're in constant flow mode and your filter starts um, to load up, the pump will actually increase speed to maintain that same constant flow. So it now has to work harder to make sure that the flow rate coming across that filter as it gets loaded stays the same. So that's one of the advantages of using the Gillian line is that when we have our constant flow mode, that pump will actually continue to rev up. Um, you know, a good example would be, you know, you're driving your car up a hill and you see the RPMs, you know, rev up. Now, you may be going the same speed, but it has to work that much harder as you're trying to go up the hill. Essentially, that's what will happen with our pumps in constant flow mode. Okay, we got someone who is thanking us for the presentation, and we got another one asking if the PowerPoints will be available. Yes, we'll have the PowerPoints and the uh, video recording up on our website the next day or two. Uh, next question, if you perform a sample at one job with no signs of silica exposure, do you have to sample at all other sites, even if you use the same tool and method? You know, it really depends on um, several other factors. Um, you have to look at the activity. You have to look at the equipment. But you also have to look at, you know, what is the material? Is the material the same from one job site to the next? You know, the silica composition in one set of concrete on one site can be very different than on another site. Same with other types of materials like refractory brick or if you're doing um, any other type of, um, you know, cutting or, or disturbing, you know, a concrete brick type of material. So it really depends on the industry. It depends on the um, environmental factors as well. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, I can sample on a rainy, high, humid day and have very good results. And on a, you know, dry day with very little wind and very little airflow, do the same exact task with the exact same material 
and actually have an exceedance. So there, there's quite a few factors that need to be considered. I think that OSHA is willing to give some leniency with objective data, but be able to back it up. Okay, well, and last question we're gonna take. Uh, can you sample for a task that is only two hours for two hours and zero out the remainder of the shift? Well, you can. Uh, again, you're making an assumption that there is zero exposure during the remainder of the shift. Um, you know, in, in doing so, you, you can extrapolate out what your exposure would be, um, assuming that there was only uh, those two hours of an event. Um, and, and you can use that if you're, let's say, on a site and you have objective data for that and you know that that's all you're doing. But, you know, just realize that a lot of these activities, especially in construction, have, um, you know, on and off shift work, um, and they can be exposed to multiple uh, activities during one shift. So, um, you know, in doing so, you can get representative data. You can extrapolate out zero for the remainder of the six hours and come up with a TWA. That is an acceptable method. All right. In closing, Aaron, thank you very much for your presentation. If there are any more specific application questions, feel free to give me a call at 866-RENT-EHS uh, or 866-736-8347. You can also reach me by email at matt at racorents.com. Uh, if you want to know more about the technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. We put out a lot of good technical tips on, our, on my blog blog.racorents.com. You can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We do record all these training sessions, which you'll find on YouTube and on our train in our training site and our website. Um, let's see. If there's some specific topics you'd like, like us to cover in our webinar, please send me an email with the subject. We have access to lots of product and process specialists. Uh, please let me know what we should cover by emailing me at matt at racorents.com. At this point, if there are no further questions, our presentation will conclude. Thank you for attending. And I don't see any further questions. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks.